um, so while we wait for this thing to catch up, so uh, I'm really glad to have gone after three, I think three talks that are really closely related to mine. So um, there's like context in Kieran's talk, in um, the, the talk on beta values, uh, and in the talk that just happened right now. So um, I needed one more terminal. All right. So um, that's not the size you'll see there. Um, all right, there we go. Um, there's, th it's both silly and actually important that my slides are in the terminal because I'm gonna do some of the bad things that uh, Andreas was alluding to and kind of break my computer. Um, so uh, ordinarily when we're writing programs, we kind of like to keep the memory usage a bit low. So here's like an example of the thing that I hate, which is, um, Firefox using two gigabytes on my four gigabyte laptop. Um, this is like par for the course. I have like 200 tabs open at any given time and they all have images and document object models and <laughs> JavaScript and whatever. Um, so yeah, for this talk, we're gonna try and write a program that stores lots of data but without using a lot of memory. So you might just think, sure, we'll just store it on disk, right? We can store all the data we want in a file, that's fine. But we're actually gonna store lots of data in memory, but without using a lot of memory. Not making too much sense, bear with me. We're gonna store it in kernel memory. So this is where some of the stuff Kieran was talking about comes in. Um, instead of keeping the data in our own user's uh, memory, we're gonna store it in the kernel's memory. So what is kernel memory, and what is the difference between kernel and user memory? Um, so on our machines, there are two kinds of code that run. There's user code, which is the normal code we write most of, uh, and run most of the time. So it's uh, the code that, you know, prints FizzBuzz, very important. Uh, we look at cat pictures, very important. Um, and you know, all other manner of kinds of stuff that we do. And these programs have data, they have local variables, data structures, and so on, and that is all stored in user memory. And the kernel code is uh, doing all kinds of important but sort of mundane things like um, figuring out which threads are gonna run on which cores, keeping track of which files are open in which processes, <laughs> um, as Andreas just demonstrated. Um, and so it's got a lot of bookkeeping and it keeps all of this stuff in uh, lots of like run queues and file descriptor tables and who knows what. So that's what I mean by kernel memory, stuff that the kernel has access to but that user programs don't. And it's really important that user code can't access kernel memory because if you could, then you could just go and say, oh, here's my file descriptor table, I'm just gonna pretend I can read the password file. Okay. Um, so user code cannot access kernel memory and that's actually enforced by a piece of hardware, the memory management unit. I think it's really like kind of weird and cool and mind blowing that there's like a piece of hardware that's like a little um, permission grantor, like access denier. It's actually silicon in your computer. Um, okay, so now, like recap. We're gonna store lots of data in memory without using memory. We're gonna store it in kernel memory, but we can't access kernel memory. Still not making very much sense here, but just bear with me. This is the interface I kind of want to go for. We want to have a kernel buffer that we can read and write to anywhere. Um, so read it an offset uh, f into some buffer, some number of bytes, and similar for write. And we're going to store the data in pipes. Um, Andreas was storing file descriptors in sockets. I'm going to store data in pipes. So pipes are, you know, these mundane things. It, this is very small, but uh, this is actually from my command history. I'm running awk, which is piping to sort, which is piping to unique, which is piping back to awk to sort to unique. I have no idea what I was doing. This is actually in my, my command history. But each of, these, um, each of these vertical bars is a pipe. That is a place where one process can send data to another process. It writes data into uh, the pipe, and then it sits there for some amount of time until the next process down the line reads it out. Um, so I have a pipe. So pipes are very much like pipes. They have ends. You can put things in one end and you can take things out the other end. Um, 
This part's going to go poorly. Um, but, um, so let's see, yeah. So there's the read end and the write end. So we can write into the pipe. And then there's the buffer, which is the data will, bits and bytes don't have friction. Um, <laughs> Anyway, they'll sit here for a little bit until then in the buffer until we can read them out, right? So that's like pretty cool. Um, this buffer is in kernel memory. The user has access to the ends through file descriptors, but the actual data that's in there is stored in the kernel. And in fact, Linus in a mailing list thing uh, posting actually just described a pipe once as a kernel buffer the user has control over. You don't have direct access to it, but you have control. You choose what's in there and what, uh, when to take it out. So, we've covered how we can only read and write at the ends. Um, but let's just say I actually really wanted one of the things in the middle, and I don't have access to the middle, right? I can't uh, uh, get it out. <laughs> it's not gonna work. You have to, to get access to it, you're gonna have to take stuff out from the end. Um, and put it back in at the other end. And this, only one, only one so far. Um, there's not much more physical props, so like, just one, and I'll give it back to you, Danielle. Um, the, so how do we get a, a random access buffer out of this, given we can only write into one end and read out the other end? Well, I kind of alluded to it just there. We can read things out until we get to the part we want, writing back all along, and then um, when we have the part we want, we give it to whoever was asking for it. Um, an alternate way is we could just um, read everything out of the pipe, which would be spill everything onto the table, um, find the parts we want, and then write it all back into the pipe at, at the end. And so now we've got a building block, which is we can store data in a pipe, but pipes are only so big. The buffer is some number of kilobytes usually. Um, but we could create a bigger buffer by having many pipes. I've only got one. Um, but having many pipes and then doing, you know, some offset and div mod kind of math to make it all work out. And, well, how big can we go? So, Linux actually lets us set a pipe buffer size, um, which seems great. And the max, <laughs> the max is a, a megabyte. You can set any given pipe to have a megabyte buffer. This is cool. So far, so good. So let's just create many big pipes, right? Then we have many, many megabytes that we're storing in the kernel. Problem is that there's a per user limit on the total number of big pipes. Uh, actually, the total size of the big pipes, which is 64 megs. And I don't like this because it's a per user limit, not a per process limit, which means that you have to like run as root or something to kind of go past it, which is not, like, not what I want to be doing. Um, so I'm going to ignore this idea. Instead, find a way to store more without needing to bypass a per user limit. So there's a code path in this, the code that checks whether you're creating too many, too big pipes that promises you will always be able to create a pipe. Like the pipe system call will never fail. It just might give you a really, really small pipe. It's like. <laughs> It might just give you a four kilobyte pipe, but you will always be able to get a four kilobyte pipe no matter what. Okay, so, so you get the idea where I'm going, right? Um, so we've got 64K, I don't know what Linux Andreas is running at. My machine has 64K file descriptors in the processes. But anyway, 64K, 4K buffers. But actually no, because pipe has two file descriptors, one at each end. So actually only 32K pipes, 128 megs. If you're like, I'm not good at binary math, I use Google. Um, <laughs> about 128 megs for a single process. That's pretty good, but let's go a bit further. So how about we have write once pipes? We put a bunch of these glass beads into the pipe, and then we just discard the write end. It's gonna sit here in the buffer, we've got the read end, and we can get it out whenever we want. And then when we want to read out, we take this stuff out, um, close that, like discard the whole pipe, get a new pipe, same pipe, but um, get a new pipe, <laughs> and put the stuff back in, and then discard that end again. So you can do this like cycle loop thing 
uh, where you're able to like have only one file descriptor, but with four kilobytes each. So close the right end after reading, after whatever. Um, so you've got 64K pipes now, which is 256 megs per process, which is pretty good. Um, but can we go further? Remember earlier I said I'm not interested in per user limits. These limits that I'm talking about are per process. So we can have multiple processes, <laughs> right? Okay. So now each process can have 256 megs of kernel memory that it locks up. Um, so. Okay, I've got nothing running on this machine because I don't want to lose anything. Um, I have uh, a top window. Uh, forgive, maybe I can make this a bit bigger. Is that readable? Nope, okay, we have to stop here. Um, Right. My program that I'm going to be running is called something beginning with K. And over here, um, I have this little program called kbuff, which stashes memory, uh, stashes data in whatever, kernel buffers. Um, and it's got some, like, some nice little commands. Uh, so we can run kbuff, um, closing the right ends, Keeping, so 65532 pipes is the number we can get, and we can try, uh, actually, just, sorry, resetting back to how it was before. This is the default number of the maximum number of files available open, that can be open on my system at a given time. Um, so, um, we've got this thing, and we can run, uh, we can try and open, create 20 processes with 64K pipes, each each with four kilobytes, which is way more memory than my machine has. And if I run this, I get like a bunch of errors. Um, it's en file is the thing, and if we run erno en file, it's like too many files open in system. Okay, but let's just run that again and look at what's going on over here. And you can see the memory usage kind of, kind of go up a bit. Um, but it didn't go up enough, only up by about two gigs. I've got two gigs of kernel buffers here. Ah, I want a bit more. So this is the only part where I cheat, um, and I can uh, increase, as the sysadmin, the total number of files to like, you know, a million. Um, and then, I'm just gonna make sure I didn't miss any slides, because we're not gonna see any more slides. Um, okay, so there's the total file descriptor limit, which we just saw. There's two gigabytes. Uh, is about as much as we can get with 384K pipes. Um, but we can raise the file limit to a million. We're gonna hit the memory limit. And Kieran talked about the out of memory killer. Um, I didn't really know what it did viscerally um, <laughs> until I did this. Um, um killer, this is the last slide, that's great. Um, so I'm gonna try again to create 20 processes with 60, there's more memory than I've got. And the system is going to kind of stop functioning, give it a few more seconds, and the um killer is probably just killing who knows what right now. I don't. I have no idea how. Oh, there we go. Um, oh, so when I did this before, it did not kill my login session. Here, it's killed my login session. So I. I Last time I had a terminal left to show something. This time I do not. But there you go. These are some really, really wacky, weird things you can do uh, to abuse all of this like stuff in the kernel. Thank you.